Hi, and welcome to Observability with Prometheus and Beyond. I've been asked to talk a little bit about my background, of course there's a new audience. I'm the Director of Community at Grafana Labs. I'm a Prometheus team member. I organized the conference for Prometheus. I chaired Dev Summits for Prometheus. I founded Open Metrics. I'm the chair of the SIG Observability within CNCF. I did a few other things, built a data center, had some consulting. My initial background is in mainframes and especially in networking. And I organize quite a few conferences on the site, which have quite a few users and as such quite a few requirements when it comes to, to actually making those work. This is all a long winded form of saying that yes, I actually come from the trenches of tech and I know the pains of, of, of operations and of trying to make sense of a system. And that's where I'm coming from. So let's look at today. Today you have disparate systems, you have disparate data. They might be uh, with the same indexing data, but usually there aren't. So jumping in between those different systems usually means a break. They're kind of air gap, they're kind of different. So you have to mentally switch model to the other, to the other system to actually follow up what that thing is, which is currently broken, which just costs you time. It's mental overhead and it's just not very efficient. Also, it makes it harder to automate some things. But usually I care a lot more about the humans not having too much uh, mental overhead. Of course, computers can be bought more. Uh, humans actually, like, they need to, they need to be able to grok what they need to know. So let's rethink how we could be doing this instead. Let's get a little bit back to the basics. And before we do this, let's look at some buzzwords. What do these buzzwords actually mean? So buzzwords usually have some, some real meaning, some core of truth, some kernel of truth. Um, but by the time they're a buzzword, they're more or less useless. They might become useful after, once they're not a buzzword anymore. But usually during that phase, everyone is just piling on and trying to, to get their specific thing named after that thing. So pitfalls of this, cargo collecting, which is a term for you observe how something or you observe the effects of something and you want to have the same effects and you just do whatever you perceive as being what the other people are doing instead of really understanding why something is happening. And to me, it's a lot more observability. It's a lot more about changing the actual behavior within the org than about just changing the name and calling whatever you've done before by a new name and, and basically pretend you're done. These days, monitoring has taken on a meaning of more or less collecting data, but not really using this data. Um, there are some euphemisms for this. Um, data lake would be one where you basically give up on, on indexing or making any sense at all out of your data and you just store it because it might, it might be useful and you can run super complex queries on it, but you don't actually, you can, can't actually work with it. Or you have the other extreme where you just do full text, index, full text indexing and everything is indexed. And this is obviously super expensive, but at least you have some way into your data. None of those trade-offs are super nice to me. Um, observability these days has a meaning of trying to enable humans to actually understand those complex systems, to be able to understand why something is not working instead of just saying that, yes, it is not working. This is my all-time favorite meme, uh, but it has a deeper meaning because yes, at the face of it, yes, things are broken. But that book is actually about how to, with the information you have, extract more meaning so humans can understand what, what they're actually dealing with. And same as observability is about taking what you have and improving what you have and actually understanding it and making deductions from this. That's literally the same thing, just in a more funny way. Let's talk about complexity. Complexity can be, in my opinion, split into two parts. You have the fake complexity and you have the real complexity. Fake complexity can just be bad design or operational whatever, or some organizational um, constraints which you have, but usually this can be reduced and if at all possible, should be reduced. That's not always possible in the real world, agreed, but it should still be attempted. Real system inherent complexity just can't be, be taken away. You can move it like, 
you can say where you want to, to have your state. Um, should this be in a distinct database? Should it be part of your own code? And one of the old sayings is make state someone else's problem. And this is very much about this. It must be compartialized service boundaries. You don't have your CPU and, and look at all opcodes within the CPU. You compartialize this as a service and then you build on top of that compartialized services and it should be distilled in a meaningful way. So humans can actually understand what is happening within that one compartment and then make deductions based on this without having to understand the full extent of the whole system. Another buzzword is SRE. At its core to me, SRE is about aligning incentives across the, or, uh, across the org, which obviously is easier said than done. There are some very, very few things which everyone should be looking at, SLI, SLO, SLA. SLI are service level indicators, as in the things which you actually measure. Objectives are the things which you, or are the thresholds which you don't want to go over, under, whatever your, your way of, me uh, of measuring this is. And agreements is what you actually have with customers, internal or external, where you actually break a contract, where you actually have to pay money or whatever. If you have your, your operations in this manner, one thing which you can do is you can introduce error budgets. Of course, if you have this SLI, SLO, SLA system, you can actually talk about what is the state of that system. You can have an SLI for your errors, and then you have an SLO for your error, and this is your error budget. So if the devs ship broken code, and ops have to fix it all the time, that counts against the error budget. If ops make some mistake and break something and that eats into your uptime, that's also something which goes against the error budget. And if you have good operations and if you have clean code, which is shipping nicely, then you have error budget over. So you can, you can use this for A-B testing. You can do it for, you can use it for faster iterations on your code shipments. You can do whatever. but by taking what actually matters and measuring this and making quantifiable and having a shared budget across everyone who is touching this, everyone is all of a sudden working towards the same goals, which might sound somewhat almost, almost tautologic, but it's super powerful to just align incentives between different players. And you have other things, because once everyone is using the same tools and dashboards, Every investment into this shared tooling is an investment into the whole org because everyone else is benefiting from the same thing. All of a sudden you start pooling institutional knowledge about your systems within or across the org instead of having your islands of, of people, your islands of data. No, everyone is working on literally the same thing. As they're using the same tools and dashboards, they also have the same shared language. So, and language is a vehicle for human understanding. So they also gain similar or even the same understanding of the services. Again, what's a service? It's compartionalized complexity. It has an interface or many interfaces. Usually a service has one set of owners and contracts define those interfaces, which again, with service level agreements, if you break them, you have to pay or whatever, but still there is a defined mechanism about what happens if you break a contract. And that's why I like the term contract, because it is a shared agreement which must not be broken. Because both internal and external customers rely on what you build and maintain, and same, you are relying on stuff which other people build and maintain, and your customers are building and maintaining other stuff, which yet again, other people are relying on. Without this, society wouldn't work and without this, orgs don't work. There is another super common term for this, which is layer. And quite frankly, without proper layering, the internet would not exist as of today. It couldn't, because it is ever changing. And by being able to rely on huge parts of the stack, and just not having them change is incredibly powerful for having faster iterations and innovations in different parts of the stack. Which also goes a little bit against newer HTTP forms and such, because those mingle a lot of layers, but that's a topic for, for another day. 
Layering enables innovation, of course, it paralyzes human engineering and it paralyzes taking care of different parts of the stack of this one hole, which everyone wants to use. One of the examples I already used earlier, CPUs, hard disk, compute nodes, your lunch, you're not growing your own wheat or, or like growing your own cucumbers. You're buying those or you're buying the already pre-processed food or what, wherever your, your breakpoint is, what type of service you buy in what situation. Yet the, this concept of, of having things as a service or as a product is super common, but it needs to be done more and more also within orgs and done properly. One thing about services, customers care about those services being up and available. They don't care about individual components. You care about those components. They don't. Same as you don't really care about the individual components of whatever you're using. Tap water needs to come out of the wall. That's it. Like it's, it's interesting to see how that works and it's a fascinating topic. But at the end of the day, I just want to turn on my tap and I want to have water. And it's the same for you and it's the same for everyone else. At least those people happy enough to have tap water. Um, there is something which is not in core SRE, but something which I like doing uh, to discern between different levels of SLIs. Primary SLIs are service relevant and for alerting. And secondary SLIs are basically informational for debugging and such. But quite likely, those things which to you are secondary SLIs, which just give you information about this, what, what environment you're operating in, is um, actually the primary uh, SLIs for the underlying service. Not always, but it's super likely. And again, this gives you a shared knowledge because you can already approach the other team with, hey, this and that thing is degrading and my other thing is breaking. Of course, you have that same terminology. You have literally the same dashboards. You look at the dashboards of your supplying team. So you know precisely what's up with them and you know precisely what terms to use when talking to them. It's super nice and it just makes everything quicker. One thing important, which is often done right, and just to prevent pager fatigue, anything which is currently or imminently impacting customers, whatever your definition of customer is, must be alerted upon, but nothing else. If it's important, but not urgent, great, make a ticket. Someone can deal with this during business hours or even during whatever time. Maybe the on-call people uh, even take care of this, but not as part of an escalation, just as part of normal systems maintenance. Only both important and urgent things to make it to your pager. That's it. So let's look at specific software. Prometheus. Prometheus 101. It is inspired by Google's Borgmon. It's a time series database. It has U in 64 millisecond timestamps and float 64 values. It relies on instrumentation and exporters. It is not for event logging and dashboarding is usually done via Grafana. Its main selling points, it has a highly dynamic and built-in service discovery, which enables you to, to grab services to monitor from a hugely diverse uh, set of, of uh, mechanisms. It doesn't have a hierarchical data model. So usually when you have a tree-like structure, whatever you're doing, once you're done defining this, it's already wrong. This doesn't have that problem. You have your n-dimensional label setting, you slice and dice your n-dimensional matrix however you want with these label sets. You have one single language processing your data, but that's the same for processing, for graphing, for learning, for doing everything, all operations uh, on your data are always done through one single language, which is just super powerful. It's really simple to operate and it's highly, highly efficient. It's a pull-based system, which gives you some nice properties around, around uh, system state or determining the state of your monitored systems, but push versus pull is largely a religious question. Black box monitoring is a concept of looking at services from the outside. For example, does my server uh, answer to HTTP requests or do I get HTTP 200 or 404 or whatever do I get um, that is built into, into Prometheus? Same or the different uh, side of the coin, the other side of the coin is white box monitoring. They actually go into your code and actually look at, uh, at your code from within. What is my code doing? 
where you look through the box, more or less. And somewhere in the middle, you have exporters, which basically take uh, some form of data and translate it into, into whatever Prometheus can read, which is the Prometheus exposition format. Um, every service should have its own metrics endpoint. You can hide them behind a reverse proxy, a common one for easier, have, uh, for easier firewalling and such. That's not an issue, but you shouldn't have super split up um, things. Uh, sorry, you shouldn't have uh, one humongous thing. Ideally, you have one metrics endpoint per service. There are hard API commits uh, within every major version of Prometheus. And oh, actually we do have TLS uh, by now. That is, I need to I need to edit that slide, sorry. But that's relatively recent and we just got done with uh, with our uh, security audit for this. So it's, it's somewhere in the middle, but still I need to change that part. So working assumptions and concept. Oh, no. That's a duplication. Time series. Time series are recorded values which change over time. You could, for example, say you have a temperature and that temperature changes, um, obviously, and you just write down what, what the current value is and by over time that becomes time series. Individual events are usually merged into counters and or histograms like total amount of user requests you wouldn't count or you wouldn't persist every single user request that is event logging. You would just have a counter for counting how many of those you have. Um, changing values are recorded as gorgeous. Of course, they go up and down, whereas counters only go up uh, monotonically. And service latency and such would be would be histograms where you have your percentiles or whatever for, for um, for how long it takes to, to access a service or how long it takes until it replies. It's a super easy uh, to emit and parse um, uh, format, wire format, which basically looks as such. You have your metric name, you have your label set, and then you have the current value. And you just have tons and tons of these. And that is how you expose your data, which is super easy to emit. I even know people who literally print F from C code. Of course, that's how, how it works for them. And it's totally fine. Um, it's really, really easy to, to create compliant um, data sets. Talking about scaling of Prometheus, Kubernetes is Google's Borg. Prometheus is Google's Borg one, just in open source re-implementations with a few rough edges, send it down so it's, it's easier to handle. Quite honestly and quite bluntly, Google couldn't have run Borg, which is their container thing, um, which basically powers everything which they have. And this was already in the late 90s. So this is literally where their success is coming from. And they couldn't have run Borg without Borgman. Omega and Mornak these days as well. Yet without Borgman, they couldn't have run it. So scaling wise, this design goes beyond whatever. Kubernetes and Prometheus are designed and written which you are in mind. Um, the only thing where, where Kubernetes really goes to, to talk about changes, uh, the only observability tool um, the Kubernetes people talk with is Prometheus. For the simple reason uh, that the people doing it on both Kubernetes side and Prometheus side are literally the same people. So this overlap both from the initial roots and from design goals and just operational sense and from personal overlap, they're made for each other. Some more scaling data. Um, having more than a million samples per second is absolutely no problem on any current hardware or, or cloud nodes. Um, roughly speaking, 200K samples per second in core. That's a good indication of, of how much um, you can ingest. And if you uh, remember that we have two times 64 bit values for, for the actual data at 16 bytes per sample, and this compresses with our mechanisms down to 1.36 bytes uh, on average in huge data sets. So that's pretty good, I would say. The highest which we saw in production on a single Prometheus instance were 15 million active series at once, as in 15 million series, time series, which are currently being ingested by that Prometheus server and can be queried and everything, which is quite a lot for one single node, especially. There are also solutions for long-term storage. 
Um, the two ones which have actual Prometheus team members working on them are Thanos and Cortex. Historically, Thanos is easier to run and it may, its main approach is to scale storage horizontally. Cortex used to be pretty hard to run and is pretty simple to run these days. Um, initially, it started by scaling the query front end to make queries paralyzable. Um, now it also uh, scales um, the storage with exactly the same mechanisms which Thanos is using. And both Thanos and Cortex are trying to, to stay close when it comes to tech. Like initially they diverged because the, the, uh, the scaling point, the horizontal scaling point was chosen differently, but they are trying to converge back. And I keep annoying people for years now about core Thanos. And this is actually something which, which at the back of people's heads at least exists as a concept because it would be nice to, to actually merge those two long-term storages um, back together into one. So how can we leverage this outside of just Prometheus? Let's talk about metrics. Prometheus is the de facto standard in cloud native metric monitoring. It has been for years. And it's starting uh, to take hold, or it has already started to take hold way beyond just cloud native uh, environments. In particular, networking is, is a field where I see lots and lots and lots of Prometheus. And by extension, the same is true for the Prometheus exposition format. Of course, everywhere where you have Prometheus, um, you also have the exposition format of Prometheus, because that's the only thing which Prometheus can ingest and understand. This ease of, of exposing data, which you saw earlier, has led to an absolute explosion in compatible metrics endpoints. And there's thousands and thousands of exporters and integrations which were not created by us, but by other people who wanted to use this power for themselves. We have standard exporters for, for much use thing, which we maintain ourselves. And we also have standard libraries, which you can take and, and put into your own code to integrate with whatever and start emitting your data. Some other project and vendors were torn about adopting something which was named after Prometheus for obvious reasons. And especially more traditional vendors, especially in the networking world, uh, prefer to support official standards. So that's where open metrics is coming from, to reuse the space of, or to reuse this installed base of Prometheus and to reuse this ease of adoption and to have a very focused and concise and opinionated standard about how to do metrics monitoring or how to transmit data, how to transmit metrics data. Rejecting this kitchen sink approach where you try to, to do all things poorly, do one thing, do it well the old Unix adage. Many, many different companies collaborated under the open metrics uh, umbrella, which is again, nice course with the Prometheus name that wasn't really uh, possible course politics. And the result is an actual neutral standard. Um, we are weeks before submitting this as an actual RFC to, or an internet draft to the ITF to then make an IFC out of this. But there's more than just metrics. If you've heard of the three pillars of observability, metrics, logs, and traces. Metrics are super nice for alerting, obviously, and for dashboarding, and also for uh, enabling machines to understand the data. AI and L are the current buzzwords. Um, logs are super nice for due diligence, for debugging, incident response, basically where you need to understand what specific thing happened at what particular point. And traces are obviously super nice for both debugging, debugging and also performance tuning to understand why that one thing was on the long tail of latency, why that one request took two seconds, like really looking into what the code did, what, what the problem was. When I started Open Metrics in 2015, my plan was from that day to have also label-based logging format to basically take that power of how Prometheus does it and also apply this to, to logging. And in 2016, Google shared that what they use internally for traces were not um, were not label sets, but exemplar switches, just an ID which you can use to jump from um, from your metrics and now logs to uh, to traces. And when Google tells you that searching doesn't scale, you better listen. So I did, and that's why uh, Open Metrics has um, has exemplars as a first class supported thing. 
And this is not a joke. I actually did start open metrics to change the world, which might sound like a large claim and it kind of is, or it really is, but I really do mean it. Because how Prometheus changed the metrics-based monitoring world where you have your label sets and where you have your basically vector math on, on your data. I wanted to take that power and to apply to more things around the world for metrics-based and also take it further with logs and with traces. So for logs, I'm super happy that Grafana Lab started Loki some time ago. Loki 101, it has the same label-based system like Prometheus. It does not need a full text index because it only indexes the labels, which gives it incredible speed. Obviously it works at scale because you don't have this huge overhead of full text index. Um, you can access your logs with exactly the same label sets. So you can jump seamlessly in between your logs and your metrics and back and forth, super nice. You can obviously take your logs, turn them into metrics um, and apply the same label sets and everything. And then they're just living in Prometheus or Cortex or Thanos or what have you. And you can use the same queries to, to access data which was generated from your logs. And you can take syslog data and you can uh, take all kinds of other log data and just put it into, into Loki. The format is pretty similar to Prometheus. Um, you have the timestamp, of course, obviously with, with events, you always have a timestamp. Um, you have your label set, same as Prometheus, and then you have your context, context uh, content, which from Loki's perspective is just an opaque stream. I talked a lot, so I let those numbers just talk for themselves. That's the first time I tried this trick. So please, in the Q&A or in feedback, let me know if, if that was actually good or not. <laughs> and let's look at tracing for a second. Pareto, 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 80-20. Um, metrics, logs, and traces are in this order simply because you get the most benefit when you, when you start doing something different, when you start with the metrics then come logs, then come traces in this order. That's just relative effort uh, and how much you need as a as a as work done before, before we can start leveraging the other like for real. Tracing as of today still has a needle and haystack problem. Because you usually have your index data attached to those uh, to those traces, and then you need to start searching for stuff. Exemplars are more efficient. Of course, they allow you to jump directly from this interesting from this interesting metric from this interesting log from this long tail latency directly to the one trace which is interesting and obviously this also works at google scale of course that's what google uses uh, and while i'm not one of those people who say well a large company did it so everyone else has to emulate this far from the if something works at scale and you can also make it work at the smaller scales, it's obviously nicer than if it wouldn't work large scales. That's, again, almost total logic. In my opinion, the tracing space has room for future improvements. If you bring all of this together, what you get is you have your thing and you have your workflow of something breaks. They can actually jump through everything with exactly the same label sets or exactly the same indexing data, walk through everything, get an understanding by humans, and then do actual engineering. Thank you very much. <laughs>